All right. Hey, everybody, and thank you, Max, for that introduction. Uh, I'm Kevin Liang, and I'm so excited to be here. I had some really, I learned a lot from the speakers this morning, and I'm excited to learn more from the speakers later this afternoon. Uh, but hello, I'm calling in from sunny California, and my talk, I would love to talk to you about escaping something I call the research death spiral how tactical UX research will not spark innovation. Um, so let me start off by telling you a story. Six years ago, a San Francisco-based startup had raised $120 million in venture capital. The product was a Wi-Fi-enabled, voice-controlled, sleek, sexy-looking product. But four years later, it failed. That product, that company was called Juicero. They had built a Wi-Fi enabled, voice controlled, sleek, sexy looking, polished turd. Sorry, but for $700, the machine helps you squeeze juice packets. And not just any juice packets, Juicero juice packets. You couldn't use any other ones. And each of those costs an additional five to seven dollars just to squeeze a few more bucks out of you. No pun intended. But wait, there's more. You have to be connected to Wi-Fi for it to work. So if you can't connect to Wi-Fi, you couldn't squeeze your juice. It didn't take long for people to realize that you could just squeeze those packets by hand. No expensive juice machine needed indeed. <clears throat> Why do I tell you the story of Juicero? Well, hey, it's a sleek looking product. It looks pretty easy to use. They must have done a lot of tactical testing and evaluation to make it run super smoothly. I mean, it's just one button, but that's just it. Doing research to improve its ease of use is only one part of the whole. As Felix Lee said this uh, earlier, Good UX or good usability does not necessarily translate to value. Uh, the team must have forgotten to ask whether it's solving a real problem. I mean, just imagine the user story the product must have had. You don't have to imagine too hard because I wrote one for you as an example. As a juice drinker, I want to purchase a Wi-Fi voice activated juice machine that can press juice packets so that I don't have to press my own juice packets. <laughs> all right, all right, Kevin, stop hating on juice Juicero, we get it. The lesson here is that you can do tons and tons of tactical research on the product, make it as easy to use as possible, but completely miss the mark. And be, you are going to encounter a lot of blind spots to your users' evolving needs, and you end up with a polished turd. This is Google Maps. Uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of this app. Uh, it's an app where you can enter a destination, and it'll show you how to get there and give you an estimate of how long it will take you to get there. Now, if you look at this image, Old estimates might give you a window of accuracy. You invest a little bit more money into technology, you do a little bit more research, and you'll get some higher precision. Now, if the team kept asking, how can we make it more precise? They would end up with something like this. You will arrive in 8 minutes, 17 seconds, 59 milliseconds. And if they kept asking the same questions, they would get to the nanoseconds. But does that mean this extra invested research uh, and time to get this level of incremental gain translates to value? The answer is no, at least not for your average user. You might need this pinpoint level of precision if you're going to... Uh, measure your trajectory to Mars, but for your average user, it's really not worth your time. And that's the point. We need to know when to ask the right questions and when to move on so that we aren't hit by blind spots. 
tactical research is like spear fishing in a small pond. You can capture the big fish early uh, or easily. And if you keep focusing on the small pond, you won't have much to fish later. You've forgotten that there's a whole ocean of fish as well. So this, all this time I've been talking about something called tactical research, uh, but what is it? You know, the, the two examples I just showed are uh, a real example and a hypothetical example of continuous tactical research. So I like to define this term, but first I want to zoom out. Let's take a step back at all the different types of research there are. I'm sure you've maybe encountered some of these terms generative research, foundational, tactical, summative, if I'm losing my breath. Um, but these are the ones that I've heard of, so far at least. And it can be confusing, so I'll try to break it down and simplify everything for you. I've bucketed this type of research into two main categories. See, some card sorting activity here. Uh, the first is strategic research, which is uh, similar to Foundational, generative, exploratory, discovery, uh, very similar type of research. And on the other hand, we have tactical research, uh, where it's the same, it's similar to evaluative, which consists of formative and summative evaluations. Are you confused yet? <laughs> Good. Um, so strategic research looks at the big picture long-term explorative adaptive goals and usually this type of research includes building an understanding of something uh, something you don't know like your user behaviors their sentiment market opportunities uh, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns so examples of this kind of research could include uh, knowing who you're wanting to know who your users are so what they do their motivations, etc. And on the other hand, tactical research focuses on the implementation of specific design recommendations that all serve to achieve the overall product or business strategy. Um, and examples of this type of research could include usability tests. A, B test, designing prototypes. And the whole purpose is to improve the processes or workflows. Now I've defined tactical research. Now why it will not spark innovation. And I've called this the research death spiral. Um, this is the product death cycle uh, coined by David Bland, the author of Testing Business Ideas, a book I highly recommend as well. Um, you start with a product and maybe no one uses it. You start asking customers, what is missing? What do you want? They tell you, you build the missing features. Inevitably, they're not using it. And then you do the same thing over again. Uh, and asking users, asking people what they want, that's not true user research, and that's the product death cycle. But what goes into product is research. So I'd like to coin this term, the <laughs> tactical research death spiral. It's a mouthful, but a lot of organizations focus solely on evaluative testing after building something. So you might have built something, you conduct usability tests or tactical research, you fix those issues, and then you continuously ask the same question. You build more features with the improved usability, and then you do the test again. And teams might end up A-B testing their way to hell because A-B tests are easy to run. Expensive sometimes, but easy. However, without a prior foundation to inform the A-B test hypotheses, we would be running those A-B tests blindly. The research teams are then tasked to do tactical research to fix something. You know, fix this, fix that after it's been built. Um, and by that time, it's kind of too late. We can improve the product, but this won't lead to innovation. We test what we know. 
and we can make incremental improvements to usability. Can you fix this, fix that? It means uh, it's a means of putting a, a Band-Aid on problems and it doesn't spark innovation. It, it's making sure our design works well. We get wireframes, more usable designs. We need to do this type of research, don't get me wrong, but if you're polishing a turd, it's still a turd. <laughs> Um, and everything is based on decisions we had already made based on maybe assumptions. It's kind of like playing a video game character uh, and you decide to level up only one skill. <laughs> you get so ingrained in that one skill, you forget about everything else, uh, the entire user experience. Um, remember, tactical research can only answer whether something is usable. It doesn't answer whether the product is valuable. You ignore the context, the motivations, the why. Now, you can get the why behind why people aren't able to use something, but that's not the right question. Why people want it to use in the first place? Why, you know, when do they want to use it? Who are these people who want to use it? How? These are the questions. So the opposite of reactive research is proactive. So we need to be more proactive and do more strategic research or definitions time again, generative foundational research to help us inform those early decisions. Doing so not only saves us time from building the wrong things and having to fix them later, but we're able to explore what could be rather than just having people tell us what they think should be. So proactive research anticipates decisions we need to make. And what does proactive research look like? Well, let me give you an example. One of my favorite stories um, is from the book Creative Confidence by Tom and David Kelly. Uh, this is the MRI machine at the University, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. The room itself would be very dark with those flickering fluorescent lights like an out straight out of a horror movie. And for children, it was a scary experience. They would cry, they would get anxiety about not wanting to go in. Um, and even when they got in, they were they wouldn't be calm enough to have good readings. So it was a scary experience. And, and doc, this would lead doctors to having to repeat the scans over and over again. So this took up a lot of time and money for the hospital. And it was a bad experience for kids. Now, if the staff <laughs> only gave Band-Aid solutions, they might have said, you know, here, have some candy. Or, oh, I promise it doesn't hurt, okay? Uh, yeah, okay, well, look at that thing. It's going to eat me. Uh, it's scary. So what the researcher did was go to a design thinking workshop at Stanford University. Uh, he learned to build empathy with the patients and the parents. He observed them in the waiting room. He observed their behaviors. He talked to them. And he identified those anxieties and fears associated with this machine. Uh, and then he prototyped something called the adventure series. So what used to look like this now looked like the, this. It wasn't a fancy tech solution. It didn't cost hundreds of millions of dollars. It was simply art, but art that solved the problem, removing fears in children. It helped the hospital save a, a lot of time and money by not having to do those repeat scans. They didn't have to use anesthetics anymore. Um, and it was so good <laughs> that kids wanted to go back. So the researcher had done some generative research. He explored the problem at the core. And that's what proactive research might look like. However, the problem we might face in our teams is UX researchers might not be given a time to do this type of research. Why is that? Well, the most common reasons would be Bah, it takes research takes too long. It's a blocker. It's a bottleneck. We have deadlines every two weeks. There's no there's no way we can do research. We don't have the time and we can't make the time. So who's to blame? <laughs> no, nobody. 
That's the nature of business sometimes. And the great thing is the fact that teams are asking for any kind of research, that's great. That's progress. But I think the research death spiral is also a symptom of just not knowing what value UX research can really provide or not knowing when to include UX research in your process. In fact, uh, many times in non-UX mature teams or companies, people have likely never seen the benefit of any design until they can see something tangible, something they can see, feel, and measure. And tactical research gives that. It gives us the numbers. Like you can measure it directly. It's easy to say, well, we want to improve X metric by X percent next quarter. It's easy to say this. <laughs> and then we do everything in our power to squeeze out that incremental 1%. And let's be honest, sometimes we end up thinking about how do we get our users to do what we want to get that 1% rather than helping users do what they need to do and want to do, okay? So what? All right, now we understand what reactionary research is. We understand that death spiral and the symptoms of it and how only doing tactical research might only give you incremental UX gains. It's needed, but it doesn't lead to innovation. And innovation is one of the sticky words in this talk title. So I'd like to break that down too. We're just doing definitions today, okay? <laughs> Let's go with the theme. This is some guy, uh, you might recognize him. He's Elon Musk. Many people mistake him for an inventor, uh, but he's really not. He's not, he didn't invent uh, rockets or cars or solar panels. He's really a brilliant engineer and an innovator. So innovation is not the same as invention. In innovation happens when an idea is improved upon, combined with, or used in a creative way that adds value. And if you look at this image, you wouldn't usually think to flip an umbrella upside down you break out of that functional fixedness. Uh, it's something we like, we call in psychology terms. You get so fixed on how it's supposed to be used, you forget that you could probably use it in creative ways. So innovation, it, it must solve some user need. People want it, it's desirable. It must be feasible. It, you actually have to be able to have the capacity or ability to build it. So you're using uh, operational capabilities and it also must be good for business. That's viability. When, we have, when you have all these three uh, aspects, then you could you know, innovate. As UXers, everyone here today, we have to balance the user's needs and business needs. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to only focus on the users, only focus on the business. Uh, what I like to remind people is that without customers, you won't have a business. So you, should, you better be focusing on your customers. Let me walk through a couple of examples of innovative companies and the difference between invention and innovation. Uber, it's a rideshare app. They didn't invent rideshare, though. They didn't invent taxis or GPS. SpaceX, uh, another one of Mr. Musk's companies, they didn't invent rockets or propulsion systems. And TurboTax is a U.S.-based uh, tax filing app. And what you can do with it is take photos of your receipts and finances, and it'll automatically uh, help you with your taxes. And it uses cameras. But they didn't invent the camera or recognition software. What they did do was innovate. They leveraged the technologies for a working business model. SpaceX uh, looked at the main problem was 
stage one, two, three of the rockets that burned out the fuels, it's just space debris. It just lands on the ocean and becomes garbage. That's millions of dollars. So what they did was innovate on how do we get it back to Earth so that we can reuse it and save money. So they innovated on reusable rockets. And TurboTax, well, they kind of took all of this existing information uh, technologies and creatively put it together into a unique way to do your taxes. All innovative companies. I want to show you a hyper simplified user journey map. The one in the, the line, the jig jag, uh, the zigzag line in the red is your current user's experience. Uh, and you might do strategic generative research to understand uh, your user experience this way. The line up here in the curvy yellow one, that's where you want to be. That's the aspirational user experience. That's where you would want your users to, to experience your product. Innovation happens between that gap. When you bring your user, your current user experience up to the aspirational, the one that users actually need to perform efficiently, that's where innovation happens. To understand that gap, you do strategic research. Use methods like uh, diary studies to understand how people behave over time. Uh, going out and observing people in their context, how they do things, why they do things, and you're going to learn things you didn't expect to learn. Now, we have understood all the definitions. So if you only ever do tactical research, you'll only ever play catch up. So I'll give you some, uh, I'll leave you with five ways to escape this tactical research death spiral when you get stuck doing tactical research only and be more proactive in our research. I like to start off with the story. Um, when I first joined Google as a junior researcher, I was tasked to do usability testing. I would uh, plan a research, meet the participant and focus on usability testing the product. And what I did in the sessions in the beginning for the first couple minutes was ask a few warm up questions. Have you ever heard of this product? Uh, would you ever consider purchasing it? Why or why not? Not the best questions, but they're just meant to warm up people. I had no intention of using these questions, no intention of using this data, but I began to see patterns. Patterns where I saw people didn't really care for the product. So I, I started thinking, why are we fixing these issues, these usability issues, if no one really cares for the product, they didn't see the value at all. Remember, good usability does not equate to value. So I went back to the team and I suggested we need to do some more strategic research, some generative research. And this simple act of asking adjacent questions and recognizing that there is a problem outside of our immediate scope is what inspired a new innovative design that sought to provide more value to users. Which brings me to that first tip. Inject generative questions into your tactical research. And a great place to do that is when you're starting your uh, session with your participants. The introduction pre-study part is a great place to warm up your participants, it's also a great time to ask these questions. This helps us identify problems that might not be top of mind for stakeholders. Second, uh, we can save a bit of time by conducting heuristic evaluations before testing. If we can find those blatant UX issues first, then we don't need to spend as much time doing full-on testing. Of course, it's not a replacement for actual usability testing, which is still tests with real users to find unexpected problems, because after all, we're not the users, but this can help save us some time. And why do we wanna save this time? To carve out you know, time to do generative research. The third, 
Another way you can uh, employ more proactive research is establish programs to streamline those tactical requests. If we know that some research from stakeholders are coming in, if we know ahead of time that stakeholders want this usability test done, this A-B test done, we can create a cadence for evaluative research to anticipate upcoming needs. So at my previous companies, we had something called rolling studies where we would establish every two or three weeks, there's going to be some time to do tactical research. And the whole team would know about it. So they know that there first is a cadence. They know re when research is happening and they know what it's for. That let us uh, do carve out time other outside of these programs to do generative research as well. Another one was uh, Google likes doing trusted testers. You have a, a base of trusted participants and customers you can tap into all the time. <laughs> And then another one is called around the world speed dating. Okay. This, how this works is you have a room full of participants at each different tables. Of course, during COVID, you might have different breakout rooms uh, where each participant sits. And what happens is you have a team or stakeholder with their particular tactical research requests uh, speak to each participant in every room. And you might spend 15 minutes each and then you rotate rooms so that you can uh, scale up the research instead of just trying to scale up the researcher. Okay, this is a great way, not only to scale the research, but also involving your stakeholders in the research with you. Fourth, many times, Product roadmaps are planned out based on guesses or assumptions. Question those assumptions. If you find that you don't have ample evidence to start building anything, then you need to push for that generative research. And it doesn't have to be like, oh, we're going to completely flip the table and do generative research. Start with 10% of your time. It doesn't have to be a lot. Then 15, then 20, maybe even 30. Then 50, <laughs> propose this generative research um, that won't curtail the current efforts, but get buy-in for trying and pitch it as getting ahead of the curve, right? Future-proofing your product, your strategy by understanding trends uh, and being proactive rather than reactive. We're as much problem spotters as we are problem solvers. And the point of all this is being able to explore areas that we are we might be blind to. And finally, we know this, involve your partners and involve them early and get involved. <clears throat> Ideally, of course, we'd be involved right from the get-go, uh, right from the very beginning of projects uh, so that we can help steer the ship. How do you do this? Have constant one-on-one -on -one meetings with cross-functional partners. Uh, know what they're up to. Know what kind of project initiatives they have, what kind of questions that they're asking, and get alignment on existing emerging project initiatives. Another way you can do this is lead and facilitate research uh, share-outs, presentations, or sprints um, so that research can be the foundation for these uh, projects. Right For these solution-based efforts, we want research at the foundation. And lastly, uh, get stakeholders in your research sessions. Just the other day, uh, there was a very outspoken stakeholder, um, very solution-focused. And we had him watch a video of a participant, and it completely changed the tone. So uh, have them observe users, show videos and quotes. It's Cliche, we know this, but it is powerful. Doing this amp amplifies your leadership as a UXer and ability to influence crucial parts of your product strategy before you ever need to react to surprises. Surprises like the research death spiral. Um, and that's it for me, thank you. Uh, you can find me on these socials. 
Um, and a, a shameless plug, actually, what you just heard is actually an excerpt from uh, something that I've been working on. I created a UX research masterclass, uh, which you can find at zero2x.com slash masterclass. So thank you. Yeah, uh, Kevin, man, that was awesome. Let's jump right into Q&A. Let's do it. Awesome. OK, uh, let's just jump right in, man. Um, OK, if you're wanting to research a topic to talk about with lots of subtopics, uh, what method is the best? Uh, I'm going to give the diplomatic researcher answer and say it depends. I cannot prescribe a method because I don't know what the problem is. Um, and the best way to, to start is to really understand the problem space. Uh, what you want to get out of it, how long you have, like in terms of timeline. Because if you have three months to do something versus three days, that's going to impact random subtopics or what have you. I like that. You're like, yeah, just figure it out first. No, I dig it. Um, okay, awesome. Uh, what are some of the most important things to know, consider, or learn when an organization sets out to adopt and incorporate good UX research into its process? Mm, that, uh, that's a big question. What things should they learn? Um, I think first off is to start putting down um, all the assumptions that people have, um, their fears, their goals, for example. Um, where are we now? I think we have to uh, recognize where are we now in terms of how we think about research, how we incorporate research, uh, when do we incorporate it, and who do we uh, include, right? And when you start mapping that out, then you can see where your gaps may be in, in, in achieving this more streamlined, efficient uh, structure of research. So once you have that, I mean, some of the important components is buy-in for research uh, and understanding that research is not a bottleneck, it is, and investing a great investment in your time so that you can save time fixing things that you built based on assumptions. So a lot of principles of um, why research is important. Yeah, and that, you know, pitching that back, I mean, there's tons of articles on like what the value of UX research is. So I won't get into that, but yeah, map out where you are. I, Touched on this some in your talk. I don't know if there's anything more to add, but just that this kind of dovetails with that. And that's any insight on how to convince execs and stakeholders to allocate time, money, resources for good research practices. I feel like, is there anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, there's many ways to do it. One one way I did in the past was um, we had uh, I was working on a, on a project, and the man, product manager was like, "Oh, we don't have much time to do this." Uh, we have to launch soon and he was kind of on the he was on the fence of research so he was like almost buy-in but not completely what i did was kind of look through previous research done and i found his name on one of them i'm like huh you did some research in the past so in the in the name of consistency one of those uh principles of persuasion i'm like hey i've seen you done research in the past so you, you know, and I asked them questions like, okay, what value did you, find, did you find from this? And he's like, oh, yeah, that was great value. So I'm like, mm, well, you know, I think what we're doing here is going to be very similar. So uh, kind of just bringing that consistent, consistency component in. That's one way. A second way is I know there's so many articles talking about telling people what the value of UX research is. I think it's way better to show it. Um, if you can start doing... Uh, meeting your stakeholders early, getting in those rooms, uh, and then having them, helping them ask the right questions, and then seeing, helping them see uh, possible negative consequences of going certain routes, and then also talk about potential positive consequences. What if we did this? What if we could do this? And what if we didn't? So talking about those uh, contingencies. Oh, man. No, that... 
that brings it up. I like the the like the recall of their own stuff. Yeah. I, to kind of yeah, to put a circle around it, like even if you're showing them, hey, you remember this last project that went off the rails? If we had had this, this would have saved it. If you could explain that, I mean that that saves it too. There's just even showing the lack of where it was. If you can kind of just paint them that picture, yeah. that's, that's yeah. a great answer. Um, okay, uh, what's what are best practices or indicators to know when just just enough in air quotes research has been done and the project can move quickly into the build phase. Yes. So just enough research. Um, this is one of those job interview questions. When do you know research is done? It's never really done. <laughs> um, but teams obviously have a timeline teams have deadlines. So, uh, if we're talking about qualitative research, there's a, a, a concept called saturation. Um, and, when you reach saturation, that's when you know that you've kind of found what you needed to know. That if you invest more time, you're probably not going to find any more themes or like many more themes. So when you start noticing those patterns start bubbling up over and over again, it's time to move on. Like, it, no need to keep beating the dead cat. Um, oh, God, I don't want to think about my cat. Um, but yeah, no, <laughs> no need to oh, keep no. beating the dead dead horse or something. I don't know. Um, yeah. Noticing patterns that happen over and over again. Uh, awesome. Uh, that's very fair. Uh, if you're in a situation where you are asked to do reactive research, what would you suggest to steer things straight at this point, I guess, to right the ship? Uh, furthermore, what would you suggest to get stakeholders to go with proactive UX research the next time? Yeah. Answer that how you will. Okay. I'll start with the first part of the question uh, if we're asked to do reactive research. So my talk isn't to say no to reactive research. Um, it's not to say no right away at all. Uh, it's to really understand what you're being asked of, uh, what is the problem we're trying to solve, and sometimes we're going to have to need to do reactive research. There is a clear and present danger in our product, and we have to address it. If the question is not adding value to the business or users, then that might be a uh, time for us to think, well, don't we know enough already? So it kind of links back to this um, and then propose that more strategic research. So in summary, don't say no right away. Just kind of ask, what, what are you trying to learn? When, how, why, uh, and then, and then kind of go from there. Uh, what's the second part of the question again? Sorry. Apologies. Um, what would you suggest to get stakeholders to go with proactive research the next time? How can you pitch to them not to do reactive? Um, yeah, it's going to really depend on the team. Sometimes it's pretty sticky. Uh, like completely not doing reactive research sometimes isn't the right approach for some teams and, and stakeholders, right? We might, uh, like my first tip, still do the reactive research. If we're still in the phase of not being comfortable with it, like still do the reactive research, but start asking those generative questions in your uh, react, uh, like, you know, the uh, evaluative research. Um, so you can start small and then build up from there, start showing the value as you go on. Um, but sometimes let's say, we have a problem, we don't know enough, and we have solutions. If if you identify this problem, if you recognize this um, tendency to be solution focused, uh, then that might be a time to think, okay, what are we gonna get from doing more reactive research? If it's not a lot of value for the business or users, what else might we need to do? Yeah. Uh, and this is a conversation for us to start thinking about more strategic foundational research. No, no, that's a that's a fantastic answer. Um, <laughs> I like this one. This uh, this is from Josh, and he asks, "Is it possible for stakeholders to be too involved in the research process? Uh, if yes, how do you set appropriate boundaries?" Hmm. Ah, I love this question. <laughs> is it possible to be too involved? I I love getting my stakeholders involved. Um, and I've even had them moderate because maybe I didn't have time or I'm just kind of consulting them. So it we might not have the uh, luxury sometimes to just have 
only researchers do research. Sometimes in startups, everybody has to do a little bit of everything. So I don't think so. Uh, there may be times where they're kind of, you know, not doing research correctly. Um, and that's a different problem, right? So being involved in the process of like thinking, who do you want to talk to? What kind of method? How are we going to show this? Um, maybe even talk to users directly, at, at involving them in analysis, having them look directly at data. This is all great because one of my philosophies is by the time I finish research, nothing should be a surprise, right? But when they're kind of driving research, but doing it kind of suboptimally, that's when we got to step in and help consult. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, I, I apologize for cutting. I think that might be the time for the last question. Um, yeah. One one more, fun, just the final one I've been asking. Again, what's the best way for everyone to find you? Uh, the best way to find me, I have a, the last slide where you can find me on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Slacks, LinkedIn. Um, all the places. Yeah, yeah, all the places. Search for zero to UX uh, and you'll find me there. <laughs> and we'll we'll drop that in and we'll have your, your slide deck and stuff. Uh, Kevin, thanks again for your time, man. This was a fantastic talk. Uh, we're so thankful to have you. Thank you, Max. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Uh, we're going to roll directly into the next talk. Uh, so we're going to be right back.